Hello and welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York, and I'm joined by Alison Markin Powell, who translates Japanese literature and works with the Penn Translation Committee. She and I are co organizers of Translating the Future, the conference you're now attending. Thank you, Esther, and thank you all for joining us for the 12th installment of our weekly program. Today, we are delighted to convene a conversation, or shall we call it a seance? on channeling the ghost languages of Europe with Martin Puckner, Peter Constantine, and moderator Tess Lewis. Martin is a professor of drama and English at Harvard University and author of a forthcoming book on Rothwelsch, a Central European thieves cant. Peter directs the program in literary translation at the University of Connecticut and is a terminal speaker of Aranitika, a language of Greece. And Tess is a writer and translator from French and German can find more about all of them by reading their full bios on the Center for the Humanities site. As today's conversation will underscore, endangered languages are not some far flung or remote concern, but in fact, a very local and intimate matter. New York City itself is home to hundreds of endangered languages spoken by residents from all over the world. Co-founded by my Queens College CUNY colleague, Daniel Kaufman, the Endangered Language Alliance, which you can find online at elalliance.org, works with speakers of endangered languages in New York and other cities to help them document and maintain these fragile and irreplaceable human creations. At the moment, the Alliance is working hard to ensure that speakers of all languages are counted in the 2020 US Census. Their site offers a number of video and audio messages from speakers of Garifuna, Quichua, Mistec, Tlapanek, and many other languages, encouraging all community members to fill out the census forms. As the site states, time after time, immigrant, minority, and indigenous communities in America's cities have been undercounted in all official statistics with disastrous results that the current crisis is once again making clear. For opportunities to volunteer and support the Endangered Language Alliance's work, you can visit elalliance.org. Translating the future will continue in its current form throughout the summer and into the fall. During the conference's originally planned dates in late September, several larger scale events will happen. We'll be here every Tuesday until then with the week's hour long conversation. Please join us next Tuesday at 1.30 for Lightning in a Bottle, a case study of publishing literary translation featuring National Book Award winner Yoko Tawada with Margaret Mitsutani, Susan Bernofsky, Barbara Epler, Jeffrey Yang and Rivka Galchin. And do keep checking the Center for the Humanities site for future events. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lachman and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at PEN.org. Today's conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please email your questions for Martin Puckner, Peter Constantine, and Tess Lewis to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. And if you know anyone who was unable to join us for the live stream, a recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Martin, Peter, and Tess, We'd like to offer our utmost gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and PEN America, and also to the Masters of Dark Zoom Magic at HowlRound who make this live stream possible. And now over to you, Martin, Peter, and Tess. Welcome. Okay, 
Um, thank you all for tuning in to uh, listen to us today. I'd also like to thank the participants and the sponsors, but especially Allison and Esther, who have made our pandemic lives so much richer with these weekly conversations. To start off today's conversation, um, I'd like to ask Martin and Peter to um, describe your linguistic identities. And by that, I mean, um, tell us which spoken, written, and read languages have made you who you are, and then describe your projects by situating Rote Welsh and Arvanitika um, in the, their historical context and also in your own lives. Um, Peter, go ahead. Peter, why don't you start? Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, so I am, uh, I was born in England, but uh, my mother tongue's German. My mother's Austrian, grew up in Greece. And uh, uh, in Greece, it was, a, from a local perspective, I, I would say it was a bilingual situation, just from a Greek perspective, meaning that we, like many Greeks, Though we weren't Greek exactly. I have a Greek grandmother, I should say, so there is some connection. But um, we had uh, a, uh, our, our village and then we were in Athens. So we would spend half the time there and half, half the time in Athens. And so in the village, uh, in the Peloponnese, uh, they basically spoke, uh, and this was in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, Arberisht or Arvanitika. Arbarisht is the way we call the language. Arbanitika is the, is the way it's called in Greece and uh, also in, in general uh, by linguists. So uh, uh, Arbanitika was still spoken uh, quite a lot throughout all generations. Uh, funnily enough, I would say that I didn't really differentiate between the two languages. It was sort of what we spoke there was that and what we spoke uh, in Athens was, was the other. Um, so it, it really sort of blended into one. Uh, which unfortunately sort of has happened to that language because it, it died pretty quickly, I think. I mean, uh, uh, in, in the 70s, uh, uh, by the end of the 70s, as long as in a decade, it suddenly sort of disappeared as everybody modernized, everyone wanted to go to Athens, everyone wanted to be uh, um, Athenian stylish with it, not speak the old village language. Uh, so, yeah, that's that, that, that's basically it. So at home with my mother, I uh, would speak only German or, or Austrian dialect. Uh, in in the streets, Greek or Albanish, uh, Albanitika. Then of course English, and um, I also went to to a high school that had a very strong Russian. I mean, practically all the classes were in Russian, so it was a sort of a Russian education in a sense. So that, that's my linguistic background, it's a bit of a melting pot and a bit of a hodgepodge, a mishmash. Is there one of those languages where you feel most at home? Um, I, th I think, I, I really do feel that Austrian is my, is my mother tongue. Uh, like, you know, if, you, if, if I'm, uh, if, if, if you surprise me, I think my very first reaction is usually in, 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 in dialect. And I think that's, that probably points to that. On the other hand, I've lived 38 years in America. I am English. Uh, so, and, and I, every, everything I've translated is either into English or into modern Greek, not, not into German. So that, that's kind of strange. I would say English is really my language. And modern Greek is a language that I've begun working a lot with recently, like translating into it, which is a new experience. And why, why, um, what prompted you to take on the project of um, noting down um, Arvanitika and transcribing it, recording it for posterity? So, so my, my, my connection to Arvanitika came in two phases. One was a sort of this confused early stage. And then more specifically, my, my mother married into, into a family uh, um, uh, when I was in my late teens. And uh, Yorgos Sukulis, my, my new uncle, uh, that, that meaning, meaning, so my stepfather was also called Yorgos, but Yorgos Sukulis was the patriarch who spoke the language. And just simply couldn't believe that, that this teenager from England or Austria or wherever, but with some kind of Greek background, would speak this language, which really had died actually by then. Um, his sons didn't speak it, in other words, my cousins. So 
so we th that language became a bond thing and he he would then do something that is somewhat unnatural which is to speak the language to me because what's happened as well in the village is that people just speak it for very very short uh they might say a sentence or two and then go back into greek so nobody nobody at this point really speaks sustained at least as far as i know and i mean i've i've, I've really sort of hung out in, in Advanitika circles, I've never heard more than just two or three phrases and then let's go back to Greek. Right. So, but that was sustained, sustained, sustained. Um, yeah. So that, that, um, that, that, so that, that was then a very intense connection to the language. And uh, we suddenly, suddenly realized, well, he didn't even really consider it as a language. It was really like, you know, so we just put one word next to the other. It's not a language. But he began to realize it's a language. He began to realize that, that it's, it's, uh, it's dying and that he's really the last fluent speaker in the village. And that, uh, and, and I was saying to him, if, if we don't do recordings, there are no recordings, uh, at least no sustained recordings. Uh, mm -hmm. In 50 years, the language will be will be gone. And I thought, and I'm sort of seeing this as well, new generations are beginning to be interested. Like, yes, we are Arvanites. Mm -hmm. On Facebook, you see, uh, you know, Arvanitic uh, uh, um, uh, web pages. So there's this pride that's coming back. We've seen this as well in, uh, in, in America with our native languages here, that there, there was a long period where people really preferred not to speak it uh, at some point for very many reasons. Mm -hmm. external and internal and people talk of language murder and language suicide meaning it's murdered by the the powerful language all around and the suicide because pe people don't want to talk it like you don't want to speak montaka you want to speak english you want to go to university you want to go to high school you want to do things you know you don't want to stick in that and that's sort of what happened to us in in, in greece uh in in uh, in corinth yeah so anyway in short sorry i'm going on here but in short uh, uh, the idea was to do a, a language project. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that with those Native American uh, languages that are dying out, it usually takes one charismatic individual who on a mission to revive it. Um, not always, but with, with several of the languages I've seen, um, I've read about success stories and doing that. Yeah. Um, Martin, you have an interesting linguistic background and a, a project that overlaps in in intriguing ways with Peters in that it was an, an underground insider language, but you had an uncle who was committed to preserving it and revitalizing it. So tell us about your background and your project. Yes, thank you, Tess. Well, uh, from one perspective, I have a very boring language background, which is just German, period. It's just, you know, I grew up in, in Southern Germany, speaking both Southern dialect and high German. And, and that was it, both my parents were German. It's very, I mean, I learned other languages in school, but it was just a monolingual, in many, many senses, upbringing. However, there was this one maybe interesting thing about it that you mentioned. Uh, uh, something that I took sort of for granted at the time, but that I now think, oh, that was unusual. And this is why I'm writing a book about it. And that was that my father and uncle inducted me into this underground language, this thief's language called Rotwalsch, uh, which is a combination of German, Yiddish, and Hebrew, and was the sort of the, the language of the road uh, in Central Europe from the late Middle Ages to the 20th century. And especially my uncle was obsessed with this language. He, he studied it, he was a poet, he incorporated it into his own poetry, started to translate into this language. He really made it his life's mission to resuscitate this language, to study it, to promote it. Uh, and he died, so he taught me some and it became sort of a family game, this language. I'm, I'm not a really a speaker of this language, but I sort of grew up around it. I was, he tried to sort of inject it into our lives and he, he, you know, successfully so. Uh, so he died very early and I inherited this archive, this incredible archive he had assembled uh, around this language hundreds and hundreds of card catalogs of expressions like I have like these kinds of things like a lot of them boxes and boxes of them and so um and I've been carrying this archive around with me ever since and so I I, I decided finally to to reckon with it and then there's this other uh, more disturbing family story uh, uh connected to it 
because at some point independently, mm. I through in an archive, I realized, I found out the truth about my grandfather, uh, who it turned out was a Nazi historian, a historian of names. Uh, and this was shocking to me uh, um, to find this out. Uh, surprising uh, and strange was the fact that among his objects, uh, obsessions, was this secret language. So he was writing against it. He was trying to eliminate it. Uh, um, and then I realized, okay, so there's a family story buried here. And so this is why this book is not just a book about this underground language in the world it, it sort of represents, but also this family history, how this Nazi historian writes against this language, how his two sons, without quite knowing that, at least that's the official story, make it their life's mission to rescue it and then teach it to me uh, who had to discover this whole history sort of on my own. So it's a very, it, you know, it became sort of a dark history. Uh, but uh, I should say, but one of the things that I think both attracted my uncle uh, and my father and me to this language also, it's this wit. It's an incredibly funny language. It's a resilient language. Uh, it's, it has this kind of, it's worldwide. Besides Rotwelsch, the other name for this language is Kachermolasche. It's based on, on Hebrew, meaning language of the, uh, of the wise, it, also in the sense of, of, of the wise guys, of those in the know. Uh, but there is something that, that I feel like this language really knows. And it, it, I think in part, I wrote this book trying to find out what it knows. Mm. Um, I, you know, just from reading the book, which is, which is a fabulous portrait of wrote Felsch of your own family and also linguistic developments um, over the 20th century, how uh, certain languages are politicized and denigrated and revived. One fascinating passage, which you've just alluded to is um, about your uncle who decided to translate uh, Shakespeare and the Bible and other works of major works of uh, world literature into rote Welsh. And funnily enough, I was, um, I was at a, a translation conference once and there was an author from, a major author from Macedonia. And, you know, the question was put to him, you know, what, what is the point of translating into a language like Macedonia in which I think there are only a hundred thousand roughly speakers at the moment. And he said, you know, it's vitally important for our language to have major works of literature translated into it because it keeps our language vital, fresh, and also it brings, it raises the level of our language so that we can express the, the thoughts and insights that are, uh, that have been expressed in other languages as well. So it makes it more flexible. And so um, obviously your, your uncle died before he could do that, but what are your thoughts about um, the success of his translations into Rote Welsh into, you know, at least your ability to understand how the language works and what it does. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And it, it's it's so true. So Rote Welsh was a purely, the complication is that Rote Welsh was as many as the, of these minor dialects and languages, purely spoken language. Uh, there is a written record, but the only people who wrote it down were the police who are trying to record it and decrypt it and understand it and ultimately eliminate it. So part of what, what's in my uncle's uh, archive are these police records uh, of this language. So it's a, it's a very ambivalent record, a written record, a hostile record, but nevertheless, the only way in which this language sort of survived as a written language. But then you're, you're so right. I think my uncle's project was to, to to create, a, turn it into, to turn the spoken language into a lit, written language with a literature. And there are many examples of, of that trajectory and Yiddish is one of them. And of course he studied Yiddish uh, because that is so important for this language. And so translating works of literature into this language is a way of sort of jumpstarting a literary tradition, if, if you will. It's also a matter of prestige, especially this is why you pick figures uh, like Shakespeare or, or the Bible. Um, um, and, um, but you also, in a sense, and this is again true of, in sense, all literary traditions, of all language traditions that become literary at some point, that you create an artifice. So the, this language that my uncle translated into 
root Welsh, this written literary root Welsh, in some sense was probably, no one ever spoke like that, uh, but it was sort of his attempt to create a kind of written uh, uh, language. And, uh, uh, and he published one book of translations uh, and it was very proud of that. There was, in his case, I think a second motivation besides turning Rote Welsh as a part of adding prestige and a permanent record and, 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 and giving it a literature or trying to imagine what a literature in this language would be like. And that was, had to do with German and its relation to German. So one of the things that he loved about the relation between Rote Welsh and German is that, uh, that it, it as a German speaker, you would sort of pick out words, you would understand words, but they would have changed their meaning. And so you couldn't quite understand it, but there was something very vivid and mobile and alive about it. And so I think he he felt, he hoped that that these word Welsh translations, that the speakers would be German, the readers would be German speakers, that it would somehow unsettle their sense of language. It would, they would shake something loose about German, that they, that, that there, there would be sort of a, a, a very alive literary ferment that would emerge from that. Uh, and he shared that with other modernists. Kafka was someone who had a little bit of an interest in, uh, in Rotwell. She came upon it via Yiddish and he had similar, Kafka used this term raking up the language, you know, sort of aerating it, turning it upside down, shaking it loose. And so that was, I think, the other, uh, the other point, uh, the, the other purpose, having less to do with what these translations would do to Rote Welsh, maybe giving it prestige and, you know, but what it would do to the readers of uh, the German speaking readers, that it would sort of uh, 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 liven things up for them. Yeah. Well, Peter, this overlaps with your comment just a few minutes ago that younger generations are just rediscovering Arvanitika and um, finding a, a certain amount of pride in speaking it. Um, do you see this also as part of your project to, it's primarily uh, spoken, the, I imagine uh, the, the, because you, you, you're working from recordings of your un uncle. Um, how do you see your project of preservation, revitalization, overlapping with this rediscovery of linguistic identity among younger generations? Well, actually, I, I should I should say that it's so we 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 have quite a few indigenous languages in Greece, Lachika, uh, Tsakonika, lots of Slavic languages, Pomakika, Nashtaka, uh, which nobody really ever talks about. Uh, um, Everyone in Europe has signed the Charter for the protection of regional and uh, endangered languages, except for Greece. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, any any uh, regional languages in Greece. Uh, is is basically really so. I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, polemic, I guess, here, but it is a problem, I think, because uh, it, it, Greece is Greece, and we speak Greek, and we're all Greek, and that's how it is, and, and that's caused a problem. I think it's unnecessary. Why not have linguistic diversity? Now, uh, what that has meant is that there has really been a sort of a, a, an oppression of these languages, really. I mean, I have to say it, that's what it is. So uh, uh, what really, what, what is happening is that people are, are, are maybe beginning to, to embrace the, the, you know, we are Arvanites, uh, um, but not, not necessarily the language. So that hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, at least I haven't seen it. Uh, I'm hoping that it's it's happening. It could be sparked from you know at any moment. But what the uncle wanted to do, and uh, well, what what he wanted to do was to 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 create a Rosetta Stone in a sense. Because my prediction is is that there's going to be an interest in about one or two generations when it's really too late. And at that point, because we've seen that that happen with, with many other endangered languages. Um, where there is a, an interest when it's almost too late. Uh, uh, Esther had mentioned New York. I mean, we have indigenous languages in New York, also in Connecticut, let's say Long Island, you know, uh, Shinnecock, Montaukett, um, uh, then Mohegan. Now those are languages that died several centuries, centuries ago or died, let's say they, they, well, they fell out of use. People, the last speakers just maybe knew a few words, 
but these are now being re revived. People are looking into, into, well, one of the dictionaries that Thomas Jefferson had, had made, um, for instance, uh, and are using those, those word lists in order to recreate the language with, with linguists. Anyway, so what I mean is one sees all these paradigms worldwide and, uh, and we just thought, well, we, we need uh, the sound of the language and what the uncle did is started talking about everything that had to do with village life. Uh, every aspect with the ideas, if I don't mention it, it's not gonna be remembered. Uh, and um, and uh, well, in order to really give, give one a, a panoramic and encyclopedic uh, sound recording that, that will, that will really touch on everything that you need in order to be able to speak the language. Uh, one thing though is of course that everything that was discussed was the way it was, as often happens I think as well with, uh, with uh, languages that, that fall out of use. So in other words, you know, we would know the different parts of a, of a hand plow, which we don't even use anymore, but th there's no way, well, that's not even a word for electricity in fact, uh, you know, let alone computer, iPhone, uh, um, Bluetooth, whatever, right? So, so that also means that, uh, and this is something that uh, the Professor La Luna, who's an Albarech speaker, meaning uh, a speaker of a language that's very close to ours, spoken in Italy, in Southern Italy, uh, that, that when they speak about home things at home and the language there is, is more vital than ours, when, when the various generations speak at home, they might talk about everyday things, but when it comes to talking about modern life, they really do slip into Italian because that's the only way you can discuss, uh, you know, who's doing their dissertation and, and who's going to be doing their defense when, I mean, we can't say, it. we can't discuss that in, in Albarisht, in Albanitica or in Albarish. Mm -hmm. so, actually, did I answer your question? Sorry, I'm, I, I got a bit- It does, uh, I mean, one, about, uh, I, was, I was Googling Arvanitica um, in preparation and um, it's actually quite fascinating. They had a very, they had a very feminist culture. Um, they, they ha women were allowed to, to carry arms and to fight in the army. They had a great, uh, important commander who was a woman. Um, widows inherited not only the family wealth, but the prestige and honor and social status of their, of their husbands, um, which probably didn't make it into your uncle's renditions of daily life. Well, no, I think so. Like Meme Mat was the, uh, the, the big, the, the matriarch of the Meme, Meme Mat, who I remember as well, and uh, would have these enormous cauldrons and cook for the whole family. And she'd rule the family, which is mm -hmm. a frightening person in a sense, but also rather endearing. Uh, hard, hard, you know, as everyone was really. I mean, it was hard life, very, very, very hard. Yeah. Difficult life. Um, what also happened though, was that the, the, when a young woman entered into a family, it was a very difficult situation for her because she, she would be the, pretty much the slave of, of, the, of the man and of everyone else. At least this is how I see it. But then would, uh, if she survives all the births and if she survives all that, once she reaches, once she is the grandmother, and she's the matriarch, then there's an incredible power there. That's how I saw it. Uh, um, there might be anthropological studies that go more specifically, but that seemed to me what, 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 how things were. Um, well, this segues very neatly into the, the title question um, of, this, of our conversation, and that is, what is lost when a language is lost? And, and Martin addresses linguistic relativism in his book about, you know, some people believe that each language encapsulates and carries this very specific way of looking at the world. Others say that language is arise from perfect, uh, particular belt on shown. Um, so Peter, what is lost? What would be lost, say, if Arvanitika is lost or any of the other endangered languages that you mentioned um, already today? Um. But I think the I think the the uh, so the European Centre for Language I think counted 125 languages in Europe that are on the brink of extinction alone. Uh, we don't think of Europe. We think of, of Europe as a very straightforward linguistic place. Uh, German in Germany, but of course in Germ in Germany there's also Serbish and and uh, 
and Jut Jutlandish and Friesish, Sutter Friesish, Sylt, this, that, the other, all these different languages, uh, Platt Deutsch, Platt Danish, and, which are, were actually real, real languages that then got relexified and became more, a little bit more German, but still sound, sound quite different. So it, it was a very, very rich tapestry. So, well, um, one of the simple answers would be really uh, linguistic ecology. I mean, um, so, you know, roses are beautiful, but if that's all we have in the world, meaning if English is the rose, and English is the only language that's left, which could happen, I don't know. People seem to be very worried. <clears throat> well, maybe that's fine, you know? I mean, English is a beautiful, strong, wonderful language. So the whole world speaks nothing but, but th that would be, I think, catastrophic from a, from a linguistic e ecological perspective because the diversity is then gone. The different Weltanschauung that, uh, that, uh, that languages do bring, the different worlds that, that they, that they capture the different knowledges. Um, yeah, all, all, all of that, the, the way of, of, of using verbs and not using them. Um, I mean, some of our, our languages here that people say are only verbs and nothing else. So, I mean, these ways of, of, of approaching or the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth person in Navajo I hear, I don't know, I, I don't speak Navajo, but I think that's fascinating that there might be more persons. Anyway, all that's gone then, so, so I think that's a catastrophe. Martin, I think this ca catastrophic vision is um, very clear in the case of, of Rotwelsch, because Rotwelsch, regardless of where you stand on the scale of linguistic relativism, Rotwelsch uh, is a product of, or perhaps determines, or both, a way of life for which there is increasingly no room. And there's always been suspicion and, uh, you know, because it overlaps, say, with the travelers or gypsies, um, Roma, Sinti. Uh, what do you see as uh, the, the, the service that Rotwelsch can provide in, in encapsulating and, and preserving a way of living in the world? Yeah. So, right. So, I mean, Rotwelsch was always uh, uh, persecuted. Uh, as I mentioned from the beginning for, by the police, it got a lot of anti-Semitic, even though most of the speakers were probably not Jewish, it was not an ethnically defined language, but a language, as, as you uh, put it, has uh, uh, based on a, on, a, on a form of life, as Wittgenstein would say, whom, whom, whose theory of language I think really fits well, strangely well to this thief's language. I think he would like this idea, namely that a language is sort of really part and parcel of a, of a way of life. You, you, you eliminate the way, way of life, uh, the, the, the ecosystem, to pick up a, a, a term Peter just used, uh, uh, you, 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 you change the language or ultimately it, it, it dies. And I think that ultimately what, what, what killed Rod Welsh, even though it's still alive here and there. And I had fascinating encounters and uh, knowledge of, of speakers here and there, uh, was, was not just the persecution, uh, then above, above all by the Nazis and, and that basically the more or less elimination of Yiddish from Europe, uh, but also the change of modernization, the, the fact that this life of the itinerant underground has changed. It, it changed in the course of the 19th century from the, from, from the road into the underground of the big cities. Uh, 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 but it, it survived some of these changes. So you know, you, who knows? I mean, it's, it's also, it's sort of hard to kill languages uh, uh, and they have a way of sometimes coming back in un, unexpected places. But yes, I think that, that, that an, I think that's the answer as I would give to your question that, and it's, and it's in many ways similar to what Peter said, is that a, a language captures a, a way of life. Uh, uh, so in, in, the, in the case of Avanitika, there, that way of life didn't include Bluetooth and computers, but it included all these other things. Uh, in, in the case of Rootwelsch, there, it, you, when you look at the language, uh, you really get a picture of the life all the words for police, different kinds of police, different kinds of poli uh, uh, prisons, getting arrested, foods, many words for lice. I mean, all the, but also fun, lots of words for food and, and alcohol and sex. And, and so you, you get sort of a, 
uh, because I should say, in, in technically, Rotwelsch is is what linguists would call a sociolect. So it's mostly a lexicon that is words, and, you know, for for nouns and verbs. The the the, gra the grammatical structure is not that unusual here. It's mostly provided by German. Um, but, but so you get a picture of that life. So in a sense, the, it's a record of, of this life. Uh, and for me, I have very few illusions that I would, uh, that I could uh, revive this language. I've seen that project fail in my uncle's case. And it's fascinating, by the way, that in both Peter, in both of our cases, it's, it's an uncle. So we, maybe we should coin a term, not for a father tongue. I sometimes thought because mostly this language was transmitted to me by my uncle and father, and then this weird, uh, opposition from my grandfather uh, uh, as a father tongue, but no, it's an, it's an uncle tongue, an uncle language, uh, perhaps. Um, but, but that, that it, 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 it is a record of that, of that language. And for me, it's a way of, of preserving that and not just a record in a kind of clinical or purely scholarly way, but also a record of what life of the road looked like and, 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 and what kind of view of the world uh, uh, it, it brought with it. Well, what, what I find fascinating about that very topic, um, the Rotwelsch as a, as a view of the world is, as you mentioned earlier, uh, terms shifted and changed according to the level of secrecy um, uh, that was necessary. In last week's fascinating conversation about motherless tongues, um, Eric Tsimi uh, talked about Kampfongle, the, the Cameroonian mixture of the native language, French and English, as a vernacular um, that was, a, in a sense, a resistance to the colonizers. And part of the mechanism of creating Kampfongle and using it against the occupying or, or, or controlling forces was um, adopting terms changing them, in fact, recycling them. And you, Peter, uh, Martin, talk about recycling, uh, Rotwelsch as a language that recycles uh, based on a way of life that is heavily focused on recycling. Um, so I'd like to actually hear both of your thoughts on language as resistance, minor languages, subversive languages, um, and also it's sort of the one thing that gives me hope that we won't be stuck with the one very beautiful rose of English. Um, but perhaps, P, uh, Martin, you could talk about the idea of recycling within language. Yeah, no, I love this idea of recycling. It was actually given to me by a Yenish speaker, sort of a modern variant of, of Rotwelsch, who said, you know, we, we nomadic peoples, we have to recycle everything, including our language. Um, but so recycling is one thing, but you also mentioned this kind of secrecy and resistance from Comfongue, and I would say in Rotwelsch, that's very, very similar. Uh, it's not so much, so it's, it's complicated because on the one hand, there is this one, the view of the police, which is that these spe Wordwelsch speakers deliberately created a secret language in order to sort of plot the next heist and so on and so forth. So there's a large amount of paranoia, I think also part of it. And so everyone says, oh, it's a secret language and they sort of made it up, they made it secret. And that, that occasionally happens, but we know that's not really how a language emerges. Like, a bunch of people getting together and saying, you know, we, we're going to come up with a secret language. I mean, I talk a little bit about Esperanto. I mean, there's something slightly maybe artificial about it, creating an artificial lingua franca. But in any case, uh, but 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 more, I think, more plausible is what you describe uh, as an analogy to to come from Glay, uh, Tess, namely that it is you take languages from the words from the major languages. Uh, you mix them. Sometimes you take them from minor languages too. So these speakers took a lot of words from German, but also from Yiddish, which is sort of a, 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 a also a language to some extent of migration and the road in Central Europe, and also from, uh, from Romani, the language of the Sinti and Roma, uh, who were sort of more linguistically defined as separate, uh, but to some extent occupied an overlapping milieu. And so you take words, you recycle them, you change them, and that that is a form of resistance. And I think to that extent, there is something to the secrecy because part of the, 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 the tool that this language provided was to create a community in the face of incredible amount of opposition and persecution. I think that's mm -hmm. true. 
and uh, for for Arbanitica, it, it was quite different because Arbanitas, uh, so my uncle would always say, uh, you know, we are vero, vero, ar, vero, vero, alien. So real, true, vero, in fact, which is Italian, right? A true, a true, uh, which actually vero, alien, as I would say, comes from Greek, Italian. Anyway, I'm, I'm walking down linguistic uh, memory lanes here, but okay, so true Greek, true, true uh, Arbanitis. The Arbanitis were at the forefront of the, uh, of the, 1821 uh, war of independence against Ottoman occupation. Um, so when Greece was a province of, of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. So, so what, what happens there is that the Arbanites in Greek history have a strong position in a way as, as, as the heroes of, the, of the, the Greek war of independence. Um, but on the other hand, all, there is also the problem of, of, of many, so you know, you hear things like Arvanit Kokefali, like uh, Arvanit head, meaning a sort of a, a, a villager who doesn't understand, or for, for the blacks who are a, a Latinate uh, group of speakers in, in central Greece, um, the, vlach, vlachos means, means is also sort of a swear word. I mean, so, so it is a problem, you know, that, that identity issue. Uh, but it, it was not, uh, the, the language wasn't, I, I don't know that one, I, I never experienced that one would slip into Arvanitika so that pe Greek speakers wouldn't understand. It was more that if they're Greek speakers around, they won't really speak it. At least that's in my experience that way. Um, <clears throat> so it was never a secret language. Maybe it was secret in the sense that that uh, Arvanites trying to blend into to Greek society and to really be part of it might really prefer not to discuss that, not to mention that they're Arvanites and not to speak the language. Uh, um, initially not, not in front of non-speakers, but then maybe also not less and less at home. I mean, in our case, also my uncles in, in Shinyan in Corinth, in, in Ayosianis, would um, speak to grandmother who really didn't speak that, her Greek was a problem. Uh, so the, everyone would talk to her in, in Arvanitika, um, mm -hmm. but then among themselves really more and more modern Greek. Yeah. Well, I want to, to, to turn a bit to your, to your Russian background, um, your Russian personality, linguistic identity, and, and talk about, um, compare the Rotvelsh to the language in the gulags of the Zex, the political and criminal prisoners. Because in a in a previous discussion you had um, talked about mentioned that it was called Fenya, which comes from often, and you know so that it wouldn't wasn't actually spoken openly. It was it was their their secret line, underground language. But you can speak often. You can speak when you speak Fenya, the Russian. Then you can speak openly uh, with the Zex and in, in the prison. Right. Okay. So that that was what where that came from, and. Mm -hmm. uh, well, th th there is a, a big tradition. Uh, Dostoevsky, for instance, was very, very interested. When he ended up in, in Siberia, uh, he, he would cut pieces of, uh, he was very ill. He was in, in, I want to say hospital, but it wasn't really a hospital. It was God knows what it was. But anyway, he, he was in hospital, let's say, and he would cut pieces of, of crude sackcloth with which he was covered and write things that he heard, which, which then became a Siberian notebook, but which he also then used in, in his, his novels. Like when you hear, when you hear um, uh, well, particularly in the House of the Dead, there's a lot of dialogue that doesn't really make sense, but that is from that Fenya. And then later on, writers like, like Solzhenitsyn, uh, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, um, or, or many of the, the Gulag works that he did, did, did also uh, acknowledge and, and uh, really, so, uh, well, brought the plight of that. And often, yeah, Fenya often. I don't know that the, in Russia, actually, I, I don't know that speakers of Fenya would know that it comes from Yiddish from often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but um, but that's where it comes from, yeah. Okay. And do you? How first are you in in that variant of Russian? Oh, myself. Yeah. Is it clear to a Russian speaker what it means, or is it sort of like the 
the hodgepodge of language that was spoken in the gulag where you recognize certain words from different languages well i i think that uh, that that you know something that Marcus also brought up uh, uh, is i think that that as words become popular maybe the the true speakers of rot welsh or fenya uh, or ingo in in, in, ja in japanese in, in japan the hidden language there uh, have to reinvent new things mm -hmm. in order to remain as the police learns learns the word and it becomes a police jargon um, you know spill the beans whatever i don't know i mean it sounds corny now but that probably was wrote the american version of wrote welsh all those years ago so now we know what spill the beans might mean so now we might need to use something else and uh, so it developed and it developed and it changes that way in order to to keep avoiding the fact that the public knows and and uh, as we said we martin and i talked about the fact that in austrian we have lots of of road Welsh, uh, traditional road Welsh, um, sort of street slang, you know, when we, well, maybe my generation, I tried, I, I tried some, some of those road Welsh words on, on my cousin's kids. And it was interesting because my cousin understood many things from our generation, but the kids, mm. like on a most next laws, like if, you know, hand over the cash, otherwise we're not going to do anything kind of thing on a most next laws, which was uh, road Welsh, right? So my cousin and I, we understand that. We're in our 50s. Her kids were in their 20s and 30s. Don't well, no, actually, no, they, they understand that, but not other not other things like Flida for money and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. I have a quick question for Martin. Actually, two part question. Um, first of all, we've heard a lot about women and Arvanitika, the role set out for women. But Rod Welsh, the impression I have from listening to speak so far, Martin, is that it was almost entirely a male language. Um, so were there female speakers of Rod Welsh, female users of Rod Welsh? And then uh, based on what Peter just said, were the speakers of Rod Welsh aware of how strongly Jewish it was, how Yiddish and how Hebrew it was, or were they like the inhabitants of the Gulag that Peter has mentioned who might not even have known the basis of the language that they considered their own secret language? That, I, I thank you for both of these questions. Fascinating. The quest second, I haven't, I hadn't, I have to admit, I hadn't even thought of, of it that much. But I think you're right because I think the speak uh, that is that they may not have been that aware of it uh, because I think where the where the Yiddish identity of this language, where I see it most strongly in the archive, is on the part of the often anti-Semitic enemies of this language. So they will be saying, in a sense, you could say the language is perfect for an anti-Semite because it associates somehow through the Yiddish influence, Jewishness and underground and thievery, you know? And so this is what we've been saying all along, all Jews are thieves, you know? So this is in a sense what, what anti-Semites made of it. So they really emphasized, they, they spoke of it as a Jewish language, the anti-Semites and use that as, to, to prosecute the language. Whereas in fact, I mean, it has, it has this very interesting and fascinating complicated relationship to Yiddish and Hebrew as spoken in Central Europe, but the speakers were not ethnically identified. So I, and I think that they were probably therefore not as aware of that, uh, 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 though some may have been. Uh, and I've somehow lost track of your first question. I'm sorry. Oh, about women, did women oh, speak yeah, yes. So no, it's, it, it's very hard to actually pinpoint who spoke it when and it what, because it was only, you know, was only a spoken language. But absolutely, even in the scant record, there are women. It is basically, it represents who was on the, it, who was in the itinerant underground. And there were, yes, there was, is sort of the figure of the, the male hobo or the male apprentice or the, the male, uh, 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 you know, deserter who sort of strikes out and wanders the road and sort of makes do. So there's that figure. And in some sense, that's maybe a dominant figure. But I also came across and I write about that because I, I did have that. That is something I did think about. Is this an entirely male thing? And no, not at all. So there are sometimes you had whole families uh, who were on, on you know, on the road together speaking, and I have records of that. And there are also times, th the more, you know, it's it's many, it, the speaker, it's this language that existed for like five, 600 years. So, and it particularly thrives during times of upheaval. So for example, in the aftermath of the, of the 30 years war, um, there were lots of 
there's a lot of displacement uh, and a lot of refugees, internal refugees, because Central Europe had been the center of this 30 years war. And so you have groups of 50, even 100 people living together, uh, you know, men, women, children speaking this language. So absolutely, it's also, and then when it goes into the underground, uh, the underground milieus of the big cities like Vienna or Prague or, 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 or Berlin, you have, you, you have uh, women associated with, uh, with sex workers, you, you speaking that, the language trickling into that milieu. So yes, absolutely, it's not a male language, even though I, through these you know, family accidents, learned it from an uncle, and I'm joking that it's an uncle language. It's in fact, there, 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 it, it's, it's, uh, there, there are women who spoke it, and that became important for me, and I had, I looked for that. And in fact, Peter, there's a wonderful woman character in your book who's Gertie, I think she, her name is. There was a, a prominent woman um, in the underground. Ah, uh, I'll have to, I'll have to look up that, but. I'll just put it, I'll put a pitch in for, for Martin's book. It's a fabulous story and you get a number of characters in the itinerant underground who come to life. Uh, here's a question that we have in light of Martin's answer to that. I think this is kind of, this is an interesting transition. One of our viewers has sent in, this conversation about disappearing deeply rooted languages is particularly compelling in light of the fact that younger generations are starting to renew interest in these languages and breathe new lives into these components of their cultural or communal past. I'm reminded, however, of how attempts to revive or reshape languages can sometimes be directly connected to nationalist or separatist movements. To take a very obvious example, the splintering of Yugoslavian languages in the 1990s. Does the revival of a language always entail the revival of a nationalist or sectarian identity? Are there ways for the two trends to be unyoked from, me, from one another? If I could say something about that, because that is one of the problems uh, perceived in, 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 in Greece. And uh, I'm upset about it because, uh, first of all, I think all the communities, the Arbanites, the Vlachi, the uh, Tsakonides, uh, the Pomaks, anyway, uh, pe people who speak, who, who live in Greece and identify as Greeks but speak this language would not see that the language is a reason to break away. But it has happened. It happened with, with um, uh, the greater Blach. I mean, there have been plots to, to, to create so, uh, separate states with these languages. Uh, and I think that's what makes, what makes certain countries nervous. Although this is 2020, I mean, we are in Greece, we are part of the European Union. I do not think that there would be a, that the North might break away and that all the Slavic languages, Nashtata uh, uh, and, and uh, Dopia and so on that are spoken in Greece will unite to, to become a sort of a, a created pan-Slavic. Uh, so yeah, uh, but it is a very good question because that is what people are often frightened of uh, in, in countries that, that, that it, it could lead to, to to break up, break up of, 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 of a nation. So it's easy to say, this is Germany, we speak German. This is Greece, we speak Greek. It's a simpler, simpler solution. Let's stamp out these other little problems. Yeah. Martin, do you wanna to speak to Rodvelsh as a sort of just, stateless language? Yeah, just very briefly, because as you say, it is by, from the beginning and a stateless language, a language spoken by sort of internal migrants an anti-nationalist language. So it's interesting that, 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 you know, to, so in that sense, there's no danger, if you will, of <laughs> nationalism <laughs> attached to it. But that may be also uh, the reason why the attempt to revive it as undertaken by my uncle and now by myself is absolutely futile. <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions that I want to kind of join into one. Um, someone would like each of you to comment on specific phrases, um, specific uh, turns of phrase within the, the languages that you're speaking about that will give us more of a sense of the language. Um, and in your case in particular, Martin, can you talk about the written aspects of Rothfeld, yeah. which apparently um, used symbols, it was sort of pictorial. Um, so we have a, a, someone wants to know more about that. 
Yeah, so that's right. So I keep saying that it is a purely spoken language, but you're absolutely right. That's not entirely true. There are these signs like written hobo signs. So this is a, the, the one book my uncle cover uh, published and on the cover are some of these signs. They're like hobo, very simple hobo signs, about 50 signs. So they are not, the, these signs are not a, you know, phonetic representation of the language, but they're sort of pictographic uh, ways of, so for example, go here and go begging and you will get something. Or there's a sign of a cross, you know, if you act piously, they will give you bread or, you know, this, this kind of thing. So to make the road navigable. So that's the written there. So there is this written component though it's not a written version of the, uh, of, of, the, of, of the spoken language. Yeah. Sort of like emoji or icons. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and are, are there any? And are there any specific Rothwells or Arvanitika phrases that the two of you'd like to share? So the, but I mean, some of my favorite, there are many favorite phrases in a way, my, my love for these phrases since childhood is really the deep, I think, driver in part of the book. So what, one phrase I love is to anhasen machen, uh, which means to make a rabbit, which is to, to escape. I, I love I love that to 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 make a rabbit to to escape really quickly. Uh, I love the phrase. Uh, there's a phrase uh, that's also trickled into German, actually even into English, to be in a pickle. So there, there's no logical reason why, if you are in a difficult situation, why it would make sense to say you are in a pickle. Uh, and so this is one of the examples where a a, a Hebrew and Yiddish derived phrase. Uh, that sounded to German speakers like saure Gurkenzeit, the time of pickles in English, sounded like that phrase. So they adopted it without understanding its meaning. And then it even trickled into English. So, so those are the, and, and Peter mentioned an, an, an another, an, another phrase like that, you know, moles for money and so on and so forth. So there are these phrases that are sometimes absorbed into the dominant language, or sometimes they're sort of misappropriated and, and sort of sit there as these unexplained idioms, like being in a pickle. And so uh, th th those are some of my favorite phrases in, in language. Peter, do you have any? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, uh, lots of things that I find very, very, very interesting objectively, like you don't think about it when you're there. But uh, for instance, greeting rituals, I think, are, are, are always quite indicative uh, of a culture, right? So um, one thing that, that we do is, so, you know, as you walk up the slope, you'd say something like, spend the winter, like, how, how are the olives, you know, is a way of saying hello. Uh, and then the olives are fine. So you talk about the olives and the thicket and like what you're going to do there. And then you, you say, so, and, and how, how the gafshat, like how are the, um, the animals? You might get down to the family and ask how, how the wife is or something like that. But so that, that's one thing. Oh, and speaking of animals, actually, that's something else that, that, that I found interesting is that, that there's different uh, taxonomy, if that's the word. I'm not quite sure if that's the right way to put it, but let's say, um, and this is something that, that I always come back to, that when you look out into, when you have hundreds and hundreds of goats or sheep, uh, you you have different words for the different kinds. You don't see them as one animal. I think that's another interesting thing, you know? Yeah, so, you know, chopra, like with a short, short, um, short, um, yeah, whatever. They're just different, different colors, different. So there's a whole thing. There's a whole group of animals there. That's something that we do as well. And I'm gonna try and sneak in one last question from a viewer. Uh, something is lost when the language is lost and something is saved when it is saved. So the question is, if this is something that can be, um, let's see, could something lost in some, uh, I'm sorry, let me just find the best part of the question. Do, do the something lost and something saved function in the same way, for instance, for social psychology or for people's literary imaginations? Are there um, aspects of each of these languages that, that could influence Psycho social psychology or literary imagination, do you think? In two more out of any other language. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can speak, I mean, I think that, you know, one reason my, 
my uncle was so interested in is was for the literary imagination. I think he had he had a sort of social pro project behind it. It had a he had a project of criticizing anti-Semitism in Germany behind it. But he also had a literary the literary the literary the fertile literary promise of this language. So I think for him it it was both. So I would I would say it's a great question, and I, I agree these are two separate things. And and I think uh, in, in in the case of my uncle they were both very strongly there. And I would say from speaking for myself as well. Yeah, and if I could quickly say, actually, uh, uh, so Arbanitika is not a written language. Uh, so it doesn't have a, a, a literature in, in that sense. But, but what, what this project with the uncle did is, is that it turned out that he, that he uh, not only in recounting the village le legends and reciting them, but all the, the, in other words, the oral literature, but he also created that much of, of when he was talking about, for instance, how we killed Anshatafia, who they had to kill because she got rabies. I mean, it was a terrible story, but that, that's a harrowing piece that you just pick out and it's this, this powerful, powerful poem because it just says it. Um, uh, so there's a lot of that, lots of moments in his narrative that, that, that suddenly create a, a, a a, uh, um, the collected words of uh, works of Yorgo Sukulis. So uh, I'm not sure if I fully understood the question, but it definitely, uh, this language, its death and, and our trying to capture it, created a, a literary moment, a very powerful one and, and discovered, uh, well, a, a major Arbanit, the first and, the, and of course last uh, Arbanit writer and poet. Thank you. We are unfortunately out of time now, but thank you to Martin and Peter and Tess for moderating. This was a wonderful conversation. Um, we have, it's a sort of, it's been touched upon in today's conference and today's conversation, but um, later next month on August 25th, we will be talking about um, the effects of st and sustaining stateless languages. So we'll be talking about Catalan, Yiddish in and of itself, and Frisian. So stay tuned and check out the Center for the Humanities site for updated listings. So once again, we would like to thank our partners, HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. Thank you. Hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.